spare time, he also works as a principal program manager for Microsoft, sort of getting the world really excited about development content. So welcome, Scott uh, Hanselman, and thank you so much for joining us. This is quite the honor. Is it, though? Yeah, yeah I don't know. I had to say that. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would, I, I was going to do the whole I'm on mute thing and then maybe spice it up a little bit with like, a, a, can you hear me? I'm going up tunnel. But, but, but you yeah. can't do that because you're not in Australia because we are on Australian yeah. internet, right? So we can do that gag. I don't think yeah. you're allowed to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I could pretend to be like buffering. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You got to be, you got to get pixelated though. But, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know how to do that yet. I'm working on that. I need to stretch for yeah. it to be unpixelated. Oh, that's awesome. Welcome, mate. That's um, fantastic to have you here. And uh, you don't have to get up at 5 a.m. to do this because it's your evening. So that's even better. No, I don't. You know, and I even went out of my way to make my lights match. And then I ended up on the right side of the screen where the purple is. So mm. I made yeah. all that, all this, all this incredibly hard IoT. There it is now. See? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, have, we have tricks. <laughs> that's amazing. Look at that. Yeah. Lower um, your no, expectations, people. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I went for the, for the orange, pink, red thing. Um, because it matches my skin color. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so what have you got in store for us today, Scott? I have a talk about uh, mentorship, uh, about the difference between mentorship and sponsorship, and then what, oh, yes. what, what we, and by we, I'm putting you in the we now. I was going to say I, but now you're one of us. Uh, what we can do is people who are maybe a little farther along in our career, right? Yep. I think that there are a lot of exciting things happening right now in software, even though we're in the middle of a panini and it's very stressful to everyone. Uh, there's early in career people. There are people who started this year. We have interns that have never been to Microsoft that started this year. They never met a person. They've just been, they went from their bed to now they work at Microsoft. And uh, we want to wow. encourage them. We want to move from mentorship into sponsorship. We'll talk about what sponsorship is. And then what we, what we can do as the elders to mm. encourage them with our stories and with the technology information that we have. So as I head on the way out, to retirement and I don't know, learn to golf or something. Uh, they will be heading back in and how we can lift them up and lend our uh, lend our privilege. That's awesome. Yeah, this is, um, I've been doing professional mentoring as well for, for quite a while actually. And uh, I love it. Professional mentoring as opposed to the yeah. amateur mentoring that I've been doing. That's right, as in I've charged people money for it and they paid, I don't know why, but they did. Yeah. I um, have never yeah, got to that level. I have got to the point where someone bought me lunch once. <laughs> so that's the level of, of mentorship that I have. It taco based mentoring. Oh, tacos! Yeah. No. So it's it's really a, an area I think is super important. Um, like, how do you know where you're going if you don't have someone to guide you? Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that because you are. Um, I should just mention before we start though that there is a Slido link, and we will share that in the chat as well. That you can ask questions to Scott about, and there it is. Ooh. And I will make sure that I. Can you actually hear me when that's happening? I'm not yeah, sure. I can I think, hear you. I wanna, oh, we can, can hear you. that Very QR good. code again. I'm going to go to that QR code myself. Yeah, the QR code. Yeah. So okay. throughout the talk, I'm happy to uh, to vet through the questions, and I'll ask anything uh, to Scott. I'll just rudely interrupt him. So feel free. Ask your questions. Go for it. Yeah. And, uh, and but to use that the slide point, link. To that point, I want to make sure that you're clear, that the, the audience is clear, that when we do live events like this, when NDC puts on a live event, it's really live. It right. Is. It isn't that I recorded it and then you have a list of what Scott's going to say and I recorded this last week. That's it's right. really us. I really did forget to go off mute. That, yeah. that was me. I did all that. Yeah. And <laughs> I I made the observation that, you know, we could just watch a YouTube, but that's no fun because we do yeah. live events here uh, at NDC. So yeah. I want Lars to interrupt me. He's going to interrupt me and he's going to bring your questions to me. Exactly. And it's going to be awkward and you're going to be like, why is that guy jumping on the key on the uh, keynote stage? Get him off. But, but that's what you would get if you were at NDC Live, uh, at least yep. down under, would be Lars just running on stage randomly and interrupting uh, the invited keynote speaker. It's the first time I've been asked to actually interrupt. I normally just do it. So just be I'll yourself, do. really, is what we're asking you exactly. to do, which I think is a challenge. But not for yes. me. Take it away, the Scott. Audience, and, uh, by the way, Lars, the audience says yeah. that muted Lars is the best Lars. So I, I like, have heard that many times for some <laughs> reason, yet I still get to produce videos. So I don't know. All right. All right. Let's do <laughs> it. Let's give, a, let's give a talk, my friends. All right. Someone in the comments said that I really love tacos of late. If if by of late uh, you mean in the last uh, thirty years, yes, of late I have been super interested in uh, in tacos as a uh, as a potential meal. So every great uh, keynote starts with a slide 
in uh, Comic Sans, because that's the way to go, my friends. Let's go ahead and have somebody who's uh, a part of the NDC Melbourne crowd uh, drop the Slideo link into the chat, because the folks uh, over on the YouTube are asking for it. That'd be great. We'll have the uh, questions for the speaker. So starting with Comic Sans, I'm told that that is unprofessional. So I'm going to improve that by putting in a fancy font, a little bit of drop shadow. Uh, Michelle is offended by my uh, my Comic Sans. So then I will add not only better fonts, but evocative stock photography, as well as my cash me. So you can send me money. Hi, Sophie. And uh, also just be noted that I am not only an old man, but also a TikTok influencer. I'm huge on the talk, my friends. Um, you know, when you're getting in started in tech, people show you uh, pictures like this and they imply that that is their space base. That's their, this is, this is my office, right? That's clearly what everyone's technical office looks like, right? No, no, it doesn't. This is what an office looks like, right? That's like a realistic view of what a computer person's office looks like. Uh, CDs that they've never used. These are like MSDN CDs and stuff like that. But no matter whether your office looks like this or whether your office looks like that, then uh, I want you to know whether you're early in career or later in career uh, that we welcome you. We welcome you to the technical community. We welcome you whether you're old or young and whether this is your first NDC virtual or whether you are an NDC long timer and you love hanging out with us here uh, at NDC. But what I wanna talk about is community attitude, community style, what we can do as a community in order to be welcoming and what we can do as engineers who work with people who are early in career to make sure that they are successful in what they're doing. Okay, I want to show you this this uh, uh, magazine. This magazine was from March of 1984. March of 1984. Look at this. We have a young woman on a computer magazine. It says Enthusiast 99. That's actually 1984, and they are using a TI uh, 99. Um, and uh, is that a TI 89? Now I'm confused. But it is in fact a, a magazine from March of 1984. We have a young woman who's programming here. She's got her bubble gum and her pigtails and her dress. And that is and was how computing should be. So I hope that even though as we struggle to diversify tech and that we see challenges for people who are not the majority, that we are reminded that this is the way it was supposed to be, is that everyone is supposed to be programming and enjoying themselves. Because you know we hear a lot about like inclusions, being asked to dance, you know, uh, diversity is being invited to the party. These are all different quotes that people use to talk about the difference between diversity and inclusion. But one of the ones that I really liked from Janu Daniel Jude's uh, blog was that inclusion is being a member of the party planning committee. Isn't that great? What a great idea. That's a much better way of saying inclusion, right? Inclusion is the opposite of exclusion. You see our cartoons, the childhood cartoons there that we grew up with. You notice how there's basically one of everybody. Oh, you got like you got one Chinese person, you got one black guy, can't have two because it's cartoons. That's called Power Rangers diversity. That is totally artificial. That's when you're doing pie charts and you're like, you know, we need a slice here and a slice there. But inclusion is just making sure that everyone is welcome, is included, and is a part of the planning committee, not just being invited to the party. So what we can do as we are inviting our new friends into tech, whether they are remote, whether they are differently abled, whether they are whatever, that they feel welcome. Back in the day, back in the day, not just in the 80s and the 70s, but I'm talking about five, six, seven hundred years ago, there was this thing called the priesthood. And this is where priests would not let the plebs, the regular people, read. Where knowledge was hoarded. The priests knew how to read. They would stay up at the top of the castle in their cloister, and they would have that knowledge available to them, and they would read to people, but they didn't want them to read and paper and things like that were exclusive resources. What we don't want is for computers to be like that. All this knowledge should be available to everyone. We shouldn't be hoarding any knowledge, keeping any knowledge secret. That's why we're on a live stream right now and our friends at NDC are making this stream available free on YouTube because that knowledge and allowing you to have access to experts in the fields is so exciting. This was a, a quote here from 1974. 1974, where they were already recognizing this gentleman, Ted Nelson, in his computer lab was noticing that that the technology priesthood, the priests of tech, were already putting people down. Oh, you know, you're no, no true programmer 
uh, is a programmer unless you've written your own Linux kernel. You know, unless you've written your own C, C compiler, can you really call yourself a software developer? We don't want uh, that kind of an attitude in our environment, right? We don't want to see gatekeepers. Those gatekeepers are standing at the gate. They're standing in front of the club and they've got the velvet rope that they can open up and allow you in. And we don't want anyone to be controlling that information flow for an entire social system for technology, whether it be JavaScript or .NET or Python or whatever. We want that information to be available. And what we can do is set up our new friends and our new uh, early and career folks for success. We can set them up for success and allow them to be involved in technology. And that's a thing to remember, to remind ourselves of. How did you get into tech? What was the thing that got you involved and what keeps you in tech? And just because you've been in tech three years or five years or 10, it's never too early to be sharing your information. A lot of early in tech folks might say, well, what am I to say? I'm just a, I'm just a junior developer. It's, I don't wanna start a blog. There's nothing for me to talk about. No, no, your experience, your, um, uh, your journey into tech is important. So what I want folks to do, no matter what level they are, is share their energy. Kind of put out the work, put out the things that you're excited about. Don't waste your keystrokes. I'll talk about that in a second. Your experience is more interesting to me than whether or not you're an expert at .NET or expert at Python. I don't want someone to say, I'm not gonna do a C-sharp tutorial. They've all been done. Well, I haven't seen the one written by Lars or David or Michelle or Chadius or Sophie or Mich you know, These are the people whose experiences into C-sharp is interesting to me. Oh, well, I found it to be easy because of this, or I found this to be difficult, or I like video content. I like textual context. Put those experiences out into the world. Keep your blogs running. Blogging is dying, and it's not my blog. I'm not the one causing blogging to die. You all need to be blogging more. Put that information out, and then that energy will come back to you. I like to joke that if you blog occasionally uh, for uh, a number of years like me, uh, for the last 20 years, you too will be a mid-level computer person that people have uh, maybe heard of once or twice. Hey, oh, Scott. My goodness, have... it's Lars. He's left Hello. on stage. He's interfering with everything. Get off the stage. <laughs> yes, sir. I just wanted to uh, say we've broken the ice of the question pool. So now the floodgates are open, I believe. But it's actually a really good question. It's Isaac's asking, at what point in your career did you realize that your strongest skill as a mentor is your storytelling? I thought that was a pretty, uh, pretty good question, actually. That is a lovely question. I will actually <laughs> defer that a little bit because I'm gonna to get to a section about storytelling. Uh -huh. But I would, I would offer this answer, this short answer before I get to that, is there are people who will find that their gift is that they're the best at what one thing. I'm the, the .NET Maui person, I'm the Xamarin person, I'm the Python PyTorch person. And then there are people who will be Swiss Army knives funny little knives that aren't good at anything. Um, and uh, then there will be people like myself where I figured out a couple of years ago that I'm a pretty average programmer, but I'm a pretty darn good teacher. So my job is to knock the doors down, to open the gates and say, come on, everybody, let's go. The water's fine, everybody in the pool. Fantastic. And that's what I like to do. So I would say it took me a while to come to that. I am not a coder, I'm a teacher, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Coding enables your teaching, basically. It does. Well, I'm, I think I'm a, I think of myself as a professional enthusiast. You know, mm. I really like people who are enthusiastic about their jobs. Right. There's some totally people agree. who there's a people who keep knocking on my door and they say, have you heard the news? And I don't know what the news is, but I'm very excited that you're excited about the news. Come on in. Let's talk about the news. <laughs> I'm running around about IoT and Raspberry Pis and open source pancreases and C Sharp and F Sharp. Have you heard the news about .NET? Have you heard the news about open source? Come on, how can you not be super excited about this stuff? Mm. That's the best teachers in my opinion. I agree, all right, I'll go back again. Ah, you're a star, you're lovely, thank you so much. All right, so back to the slides, my friends. So you share your energy, which is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get you excited about this stuff. That energy will come back to you, but I made a comment here in the middle. I said, don't waste your keystrokes. Don't waste your keystrokes. When I say conserve your keystrokes, that's really significant. This is really important. Um, you have a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. That's a really intense statement, right? We've gone from this super high energy talk to being like, uh, okay, thanks for that bit of mortality. But let's say, I'm just looking at the flow of chat here. Let's say that 
Sophie emails me and she's like, hey, Scott, great talk. Saw you at NDC. You're awesome. Here's a question. I mean, I know Sophie from the internet, like Twitter, but I'm not going to go and give Sophie 2,000 of my keystrokes for free. I'm not going to be like, tappity, 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 write a whole long email. And then she's like, thanks. Okay. What happened to those keystrokes? They were thrown out into the universe. But what can I do with them? I can put them anywhere with a URL. I can put them in a blog, in a medium post, in a, in a SharePoint, in a Word doc, in a Google doc, somewhere, in a pamphlet, in a book. I could do a YouTube video. When someone emails you, when an early and career person emails you a question, it is a gift. They have given you a gift of an awesome question. Wouldn't you rather give them a URL to the answer to that question than to just type, 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 burn a half an hour, and then it goes out there? The best part is that when I go to sleep, that email that I that 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 um, that URL that blog post that I put out there works for me while I'm sleeping. See, so you might say, well, no one's going to visit my blog. Maybe I'm only going to have like two people visit my blog. Well, then if two people visit your blog, you just double the number of keystrokes you have. But most likely, 10, 100, 200 people are going to visit your blog, right? And what that means is that that is going to uh, multiply your power. Like I said, I'm a mid-level blogger. You know, I'm kind of known, but like I'm, I can't go. I'm not, I'm not getting recognized at the grocery store. But in the computer world, hey, oh, yeah, someone's a pretty good guy. That's because I show up consistently for the last 30 years, and I share my stuff as much as I can. And I think that we as a community should do the same. You're here right now. You're in the top one percent of programmers. I just made up that. Uh, statistic because you're here at NDC and you're watching this talk. If you have a blog, even higher. If you're on social media, you're sharing your information. If you volunteer at your local school, if you have a mentorship relationship like Lars is talking to people and lifting them up and lifting their voices, you're in the top uh, percentage of, of programmers because you're not just coding, you are sharing the knowledge. Chad makes a comment in the chat here where he says everyone's blowing the cobwebs off their blog right now. Own your URLs, my friends. Own the URL. Own your own your words. Don't give Facebook your words. Don't give Twitter your words. Your words should start at a domain that you own, that you control, and then you share them on social. But where's MySpace? It's gone. Where's GeoCities? It's gone. All those websites are gone. Your keystrokes belong in a place where you control it. You control it. All right, my friends? So... Oh, Michelle makes another great point. If you raise your hand, if you paid for a URL with the intention of a blog and never did anything, I have 49 registered domains. So I've been there. Trust me. There's only one that matters. It's my name. Yes, 49. Lars. Hello. Yeah. I just pop up from time to time. This is fantastic. Um, so I think, yeah, I had another question and it was pertinent right to what you were saying before and bronze asking that the, you know, the number of topics and everything is, is not a problem for blog articles, lots of ideas, but the hardest part is the example code and actually kind of making it usable, like a tutorial kind of thing. Any tips for that? Mm. Well, ultimately, uh, I would say back in the day, it was snippets, right? You help people with like five or 10 snippets. These days, a GitHub repo or a gist is a really great place to do that kind of stuff. Uh, I think it's fair to say that GitHub's not going to go anywhere. Uh, usually, if it's a complicated thing, I'll zip it up and I'll have a release. And here's the sample, like babysmash.com, a game for babies, is a sample that I made a number of years ago. Um, I, I usually use GitHub for long, complicated examples. And I always make it so I can go git clone and then you type build, right? And everything sucks if you go to clone or GitHub repo and it doesn't build. So then no, oh we've all been there. Right? So I recommend <laughs> that. But I wouldn't get overwhelmed. I wouldn't get overwhelmed to the point where you feel that you need to have a complete sample, right? Yep. Sometimes just, you know, 20 or 30 lines of code is all people need. Keep in mind that all of Stack Overflow succeeded very well without fully downloadable, perfect samples. Therefore, your blog can too. That's true. Very good. Thanks, God. All right. Um, now, moving on to the next thing, you might say, well, I don't want to kick off my blog. I don't want to go and blow the dust off my blog because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm an amateur. Oh, they're actually, by the way, they're arguing now about gist versus gist. I've never heard anyone say gist. Tell me the gist of your day. No, it's gist. And it's gif, hard G, gist, soft G. But now it's going to become a whole thing. And everyone's arguing now, and they're going to go off and talk about other things. We're all amateurs. We're all amateurs. There are no professionals. I went to school 30 years ago. My degree doesn't mean anything anymore. It just taught me, my degree taught me how to learn. 
My degree taught me how to absorb information. My degree taught me assembly language and object Pascal and, and C. And other than C, I'm not using any of those things anymore. So the argument that there are, everyone's a professional and an expert is, uh, is, is, is those days are over. I think that sometimes people come around saying, you know, I got, uh, I got 20 years experience, been doing this for 20 years, doing this for, for 30 years. Well, do you have 20 years experience or do you have the same years experience 20 times? This is a really important thing. This is one of those like pause for effect type, like things that make you go, hmm, hmm, right? Do you have the same years experience 20 times? We have to be honest with ourselves. I want you to think about this and maybe post it in the chat. Let's say you have five years experience or 10 or 15. Do you feel good about all of those years? I've been doing this for about 30 years. To be really honest with you here live at NDC, I would tell you that about seven of them, I kind of slept through. I slept through those years, meaning I wasn't present. I wasn't intentional. I wasn't in the moment. I wasn't really there. And the experience that I could have gained by being present in the moment, taking classes, taking notes, being conscious in meetings, not sleep walking through it because life happens. Uh, those years were wasted. Those years are over. So the truth is I probably have about 23 years experience, not 30. Maybe of the last five, the pandemic was your year where, you know, nothing got done. I didn't learn anything. I didn't, it didn't grow. What this is for me is a reminder of two things. One, to be honest with myself about, you know, well, I stayed at this company five years and I didn't really learn anything. So I wouldn't really feel like that was five good years of experience. But also uh, whether or not I want to, you know, stand in my stand in my own understanding of computers and say, yeah, the first couple of years were rough, but the last five years were great. It, ask yourself how much experience you have and whether or not uh, you, uh, uh, you want to assert those years. I'm looking here. Uh, in the chat here, someone says same years experience a number of times. Interesting. Uh, Michelle is pointing out how incredibly old I am. So thank you for that gift. And uh, oh, I love this. Uh, Sirdar is saying that they've learned more in the last two years and the previous change because the job change was a good kick to get their mojo back. I love it. This is fantastic. Really great stuff. Bad experience can be good experience, but also poisonous companies you might need to get out of there. Make sure that you are conscious. And this is a moment for you, maybe after this talk, to sit quietly and ask yourself, what did I learn this year? What could I do if I wake up tomorrow and change my perspective? Maybe I'll feel like I could get my mojo back and uh, go ask different questions or listen more at work. I really love this slide with Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee, of course, you know, was one of the inventors of the World Wide Web. And notice his job title. He didn't say the, he didn't say he's the web developer. Like, you know how I really wanted to be senior web developer. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait till I get senior in front of my title. And now here's Tim Berners-Lee and he could have just said the, I'm the web developer. Yeah, I made it, that was me. But he's modest and he says web developer. So if he's got that good attitude, then I too am going to have that good attitude. I love that Sophie points out no more sleep living. A lot of really great stuff happening in um, uh, in the chat here. Cause Sardar is pointing out humility, humility, one hundred percent. I love that. Another thing that's worth pointing out is the idea of finding a mentor. We talked a little about this in the opening with Lars. Finding a mentor. You're never too old to get good advice. Remember how I said uh, I wanted you all to become mentors. I also want you to find one. I want you to find a mentor. That means that, uh, you know, I could go around with an attitude of like, hey, I'm old. I should mentor as many people as possible. Who's my mentor where I'm the mentee? Maybe they're younger than me. Maybe they're going to give me a fresh perspective. What flavor of mentor do you want? Do you want a, a life coach? Do you want a, uh, a coding mentor? I might, you know, hire a 22-year-old or be, befriend a 30-year-old to teach me Python. It's not about the age. It's about the difference in experiences. So I don't want to be... Uh, egotistical imply that I don't need a mentor. But then if you're early in career, maybe you're only three or four years into programming, you're not too young to share your experiences. So you can go back and share because you're just a few years ahead of those people, right? You're just a few years ahead of people. Now, here's where things get really interesting because when programmers start thinking about word definitions, they start to parse those words, right? 
because with object-oriented programming, you know, uh, naming things is important. You might look at the words mentorship versus sponsorship and not think that they're any different. But mentors, they help you with your strengths, they advise you, they guide you. Sponsors, they are spotlights and they are kind of creating luck. They are inventing luck, creating luck, and they lift you up into new spaces. A mentor says, you should try to get into that meeting. That could be good for your career. A sponsor takes you into that meeting, sits you at the table, and then backs away, which is a very different perspective. So you'll have a collection of mentors and a collection of sponsors, and they'll come and go. They'll come and go in your life. Uh, you won't necessarily have lifelong mentors. That's another important thing to think about. You can even go and look at sponsorship as a spectrum, as a spectrum from more passive mentors that give you advice, all the way up to someone who's fully advocating at you for you. And you may already have one of these at work. Who's the person at work who's the opportunity giver? Who's the person at work who's a connector and connecting you to, uh, to new uh, opportunities and new people? Uh, that's gonna be different perhaps than the person who is the strategizer, who's helping you plan your career and think about your strategies and things like that. So we, myself, as a later in career person, can start what's called lending privilege. Lending privilege can be like my positional privilege, like I'm kind of a you know a high up person at Microsoft. So someone who's earlier in their career, who has a lower rank, I can lend my privilege and I can say, you should come into this meeting. You should join us in this standup and I'll lift them up. And I have unlimited amounts of that. I can bring an unlimited number of people into uh, a meeting like that. Uh, I can share opportunities with them. I should say, you could come speak at uh, uh, at NDC. I have a feeling like Lars is going to pop in at any moment. He's stressing me out. Ah, there he is. Here I am. <laughs> yes, sir. That was, What's on your mind? That was eerie. I did not prompt that for you. And here I was. Anyway, <laughs> um, we've got another question, which actually I can relate to quite a lot because I live in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I travel in to Melbourne today to host this so that we wouldn't have to talk through, you know, two cans and some string and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I live in a rural area. How do you find mentors in a rural area? Because it can be mm -hmm. really, really tricky. Yeah. Well, I think that we all learned over the last year that video is a thing. And yep. uh, it's funny how we have discovered, uh, keep, keeping in mind that I've worked remotely from a rural area in rural Oregon for Microsoft for the last 15 years. I've never Everyone thinks I live in Seattle. I have never lived or worked in Seattle. And I occasionally drive up there, but I haven't been up to work in two years. So I've been telling people, myself, Phil Hack, Damian Edwards, we've been saying video, video, video for 15, 20 years. Now we've proven it. Mm -hmm. Now we have Discord, we have Twitter, we have StreamYard, we have Zencaster, we have opportunities to have these, these, these get togethers. So you can organize a virtual get together. You're organizing your game, your gamer friends and your D and D friends on Discord. Why don't you get involved with a mentorship ring? Not just a one-on-one -on -one mentorship ring, but a a pool of people who all need different things at different levels. And I've assembled a couple of mentorship rings uh, at uh, at Microsoft, and I'm trying not to be the leader of the ring, but rather the facilitator. And then it's a matchmaking kind of thing. Oh, like you know, uh, I don't know, rock climbing compiler design, you should talk to so-and-so. They're interested in compiler design. And then you have a, an engagement for two weeks, three weeks, or whatever totally. you learn what you need to le learn. So you want to kind of have that um, that connecting, connective tissue happening. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. The people that I mentor, uh, I've never, oh, I've met one of them, but the others I've never met face-to-face. -face. Yeah. So it's very, very possible. Yeah. But it's all about what feeds your spirit. Again, this is about being intentional. Mm. For me, I have a, a bagel shop that I go to, uh, and I meet people there at the bagel shop. So we commiserate over bagels, but then I have people who are in other time zones, and we do our, kind of our Skype calls or our team calls, and we have those conversations. The important yeah. part is not to just show up and talk. It's to have a plan. Like, what are we gonna talk about today? Set a, a light agenda. And the thing that I need to always remember as a uh, as an older person, as a an, an elder, is a mentorship relationship with, let's say, 20-year-old Lars should not be Scott lectures Lars every week no, like absolutely. an uncle. And you go, oh, thank you so much for your wisdom, old man. And then that's our relationship, all right? I can't wait to get a gray beard myself. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's coaching, it's encouragement, it's strategies, and it needs to be, yeah, people are saying peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. 
Those yeah, are the kind well, of things. I think the key word is intention. I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's yeah. got to be intentional. And, and and actually, one other thing, Aaron uh, Dandy in the chat here is saying that they went into the Rust Discord and they got a stranger to par with pair with them rather on a, a bad program. There Remember how I said, all I've done, all Lars has done in the last you know twenty years is shown up. You're known in the community because you arrive. You are there. If you show up in the Rust Discord for some weeks, it's not going to be weird for you to say, I'm looking for a mentor. No. Right. If you show up on day one of Twitter, one follower, you said nothing, I'm looking for a mentor, you're basically taking a chance. Who knows? But if it's like, oh, yeah, that's so and so, that's JT. He's always at the user group. Good dude. You should introduce them to Sophie. You should introduce them to Chadius. They could hang out together and mentor. Showing oh. up is a big part of life. Fantastic. Uh, I'll go back in my hole. Oh, lovely. All right, cool. Are we having fun, my friends? I hope this isn't uh, isn't boring you. This is good. All right. The other thing that people don't remember and they don't realize about mentorship is that it happens in phases, right? Mentor in phases. What is your career phase? What is their phase? And um, make sure that you're conscious about where they are positionally, especially if they're th that you're they're at your job. If they are diagonal to you at your job, that's ideal. That means they're not your boss. You don't have your boss mentor you or your boss's boss mentor you. What you do is you find someone who's above you in rank in another org. That means that they can't affect your reviews. They can't mess up your reviews. They can't hurt you. But they are a parallel universe, a low-key variant, as it were, of yourself. That's a best kind of mentor, someone who is a future version of you. And as we mentioned before, when Lars popped in, mentorship is a two-way street, not a scheduled regular lecture from an old person. Super important. Okay, so let's talk about some stories. I'll tell you a couple of fun stories that make me happy, and you can tell me if they're stupid. That'll be fun. Remember before I mentioned Swiss Army knives? This is a big thing for me. I really am a fan. I actually have the Swiss Army knife that my dad bought me when I was 12, and I keep it always available to me on my desk here, not just because it's got cool, you know, hex screwdriver type stuff. And, and the Swiss army knife has a pen. It's got a freaking pen. So I can look at that. Can't really see it. Oh, that's tweezers. That's because I'm blind. It's got a pen in the thing. It's got tiny screwdrivers in the thing. The thing about the Swiss army knife that's interesting is that the Swiss army knife is a really a lousy pair of scissors. It's not really good at anything. It's kind of mediocre. It is a generalist. It's okay to be a generalist, right? It's okay to be a funny little knife that isn't amazing at everything. But we can we can say one thing about the Swiss Army knife is it is a good knife. So when you are thinking about technology, often you're gonna try to say, should I, should I just specialize in jQuery? Should that be my thing? I'll just be the best person at jQuery. And then jQuery goes away or React or Angular or whatever, or technology du jour goes away. What doesn't go away? CPUs, memory, storage, distributed systems, design patterns. None of those things are technology specific. Be a good knife. Yes, Lars. <laughs> oh, you did notice. Um, there's there. Questions are coming now. Quick, thick and fast. That's yeah. lovely. I know. It's really good. So um, I got two that are sort of related, but um, I'll go with the first one first. What tips do you have for a mentee? So how can a mentee get the most out of it mm -hmm. uh, from a mentor, obviously, and, and besides buying tacos for him? Yeah. Bribery, of course, is gifts is really what it's all about. Um, what a mentee can do, and this is this is important, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stare into the camera for this one. Show up. Yeah. I have had agree. mentees ghost me on meetings. I've had mentees show up and have nothing to say. I've had mentees complain about how everyone sucks but them. I've had mentees not take responsibility for the things that they're doing. Show up with questions, with an agenda of three items, and pull the information from your mentor. What do you want to know? I'm dealing with a difficult person at work. I don't understand hash tables. Please explain the cloud to me. And that sets your mentor up for success. If you do that, then you're going to get what you want out of it, as opposed to a lecture from a, an elder once a week. Yep, T completely agree. Um, yeah, yeah, be Lovely. prepared. And then the other one is, as a consultant, it's sometimes difficult to be a mentor because I can't bill the time. Should seniors use a percentage of their time to mentor? That's Ooh, a really good question. That's a tough one. As a consultant, 
when you're thinking about your life in the context of hourly, that is a challenge. Yeah. The way that I did that when I was a consultant is I thought about not just my billable hours, but I thought about all of my hours, meaning all of my waking hours and be intentional about that. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this every day, but what, what an interesting challenge it would be um, if you wrote down every single hour for a week, not 40 hours, I mean seven times 24. Mm -hmm. And you have to be honest with yourself. Sunday afternoon, sat in the garden for three hours, 2 a.m. on a Tuesday, binge watched Netflix because yep. my job sucked that day and I needed to revenge nighttime procrastination and steal the time back because my job sucks and I hate it. So I watched something stupid on Netflix for three hours. Be intentional about it. Then look at that and think to yourself, wow, I wasted what? Some amount of time. Now I'm not saying I'm advocating for hustle culture or what's called productivity culture. Every minute counts. No, like you can take a leisurely crap on the toilet and scroll on TikTok. That's allowed. But if you burn three hours watching Netflix, maybe burn two hours watching Netflix. Maybe mm. walk on a treadmill and watch Netflix. Like what can you do to combine things to fold hours together? Right? I started doing TikToks on my treadmill, on walks, combining two things, right? Um, and I bet you you could find an hour or two that you had wasted that would be a gift to someone else and it wouldn't affect your billable hours. Good answer. Thanks, Scott. Good stuff. Lovely. Lars adding value. All right. Let's try to get through some of these interesting questions here. These are uh, some stories and some stuff that is uh, that I'm thinking about. First, young people and problem solving comes up. I think that problem solving is asking yes, no questions at scale. All right. Yes, no questions at scale. Yes, no questions at scale is how you debug. And when you as an early in career person sits down with a later in career person and you wonder why I've been trying to debug this for six hours and they just, they just had it right there. I'm going to share with you the reasons that those senior people can do that. And one of the fundamental things that they can do is they can eliminate entire classes of problems with a yes, no question. All right. So here's a question for you, my friends. Actually, Lars, pop in here for a second. You're going to be the young person in this experiment. Pop in here. Pretend that you're a uh, nice Hi, Scott. <laughs> Maybe don't do that. Too much? No, that sorry. A little too much. A little too on the nose. <laughs> All right. Lars, young person, my toaster is broken, and I really want toast. We're going to learn how to be a programmer today. I need toast. Help me out, buddy. What's, the, uh, what's going on with my toaster? Have you got a lighter? <laughs> you just put a lighter? What does a lighter have to do with the toaster? You're toast solving it, but I just burn the toast directly? Well, toast is just, you know, carbohydrates turning into sugar. You just add heat, isn't it? <laughs> All right. I need it to actually, I want to use the toaster I paid for. Oh, you do? Okay. Plugged yep. it in. It's not working. Uh, you know, a simple-minded person might say, well, just buy a new toaster. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no. But we're going to debug it because you and I are systems thinkers. Okay? Yes. So give me some questions to ask. What are some yes? Oh, there we go. Hassan says, is it plugged in? Yeah, says, yes. a new one. That's a good one. It could be a hardware problem. Have right? you tried turning it off and on again? Okay. Is the power on? I like that. How would I test mm -hmm. to see if the power to the toaster is on? We put something else into the PowerPoint. Oh, look at that. Plug in something and else. See how it's like, we did not plan this. No, okay. we didn't. <laughs> I plugged, we didn't, we didn't talk about this. Episode. I plugged in a light. The light is not turning on, which uh -huh. I do. Know. Call electrician. No, you see if, uh, you're sure the light's working. Well, you can keep going down that path, but yeah, yeah. there's that path. What else right. is broken? Okay, so uh, is it connected to the Wi-Fi, Peter says. Good question. Yeah, I, <laughs> I hope not. Um, so uh, I don't know. I, I plugged it in. I got no power anywhere. So is the power even on in the mm -hmm. house? How would I go and see if the power in the house is even on? And, and if it's see bigger if the than the neighbor's that? got power. Yeah. Look at you. How did you know that? Because it happens frequently when I leave, when you live rurally. You live in rural Australia. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do the neighbors have power? That's mm. a great question. We started this whole thing. I just want burnt bread. And it's now right. we're asking a fundamental question about does the neighbors have power? And if you wanted to take it, you know, maybe as far as like Dylan Beatty would take, was there an EMP? Has there been an attack? <laughs> have the aliens uh, taken over, right? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. All of this is part of the system, right? It's always DNS, whatever it is probably. But the point is when you're a programmer, you need to be thinking about systems. It's not about toaster expertise. 
it's not about no. having a degree in toast. It's about, well, where does the toaster fit into the system? If someone were to, by the way, I don't know, I don't know if you saw this last night, but I was doing something stupid. I recorded myself taking LinkedIn assessments live on my phone for products I don't know anything about. Did not see that. <laughs> so Sounds amazing. I go onto LinkedIn and it's like, you should become uh, certified in, in AWS. So I'm like, okay, I don't sure. know anything about AWS, right? I know it's a cloud. <laughs> So I recorded the screen and I started taking the test and I passed and I'm now certified in AWS. That is fantastic. So a new job opportunity. Fantastic. Exactly. Does that mean I'm smart and I know lots about AWS? No, no, not at all. It means systems thinking, right? Yep. Computers have CPU and memory and subnets are things. I have, an, I have a funny example for that actually. Well, let's not say funny clown, haha, but interesting because I like cars, right? But I grew up with 10 thumbs. I had no idea about fixing anything but applying software debugging skills to cars actually goes a really, really far, uh, a really long way. Cause it's so like, yep. what's not working? Okay, that's working, then you do the next thing and it's this exact same approach, so. Systems thinking is the deal. So if we go back to the slides and we look at someone who's early in career versus someone who's later in career, the reason that you're Googling a lot for stuff, hopefully with Bing, you are, you don't know what question to ask. Later in the career, it's not that we know stuff, it's that we know questions to ask. Right, and as the American president Abraham Lincoln said, it's always DNS. I made a list on the left-hand side here of things to check. This is literally just a silly list that I just made up of like a young person comes to me and asks me what's wrong and I ask all these questions and then they fix it and they go, oh my goodness, how did you know? You're so smart. Oh wow, I can't wait till I'm experienced. Now, I don't know what's going on. When, when non-technical parent calls me and I'm like, look for a gear, click on the gear. Like, is there anything like a gear? It's and not if that they ask, if they ask to fix the printer, you just run away because yeah, you never can. Turn it off and turn it on again. Yeah. And then as my, and the other thing to watch out for, right, is uh, if you see, if you hear hoof beats, you want to think horses, not zebras. Uh, as my sons were watching Sherlock Holmes recently and this lady killed her husband and then she was also seen on the other side of town. And Watson says to Sherlock Holmes, it was twins. That's how they did it. There's twins. And Sherlock Holmes says, it's never twins. It's too obvious. It's never twins. These are all just things to check. You, as an early and career person, will collect these items. So problem solving is collecting questions and asking yes, no questions at scale. Let's bang through the last couple ones here as we get towards the end of our chat. So layering is when you start hiding complexity. It's vertical, vertical layering. And layering in computer science is actually not layering. It is lying. It is the computer lying to you. When you call an API or you make a function in a virtual machine, it's an abstraction on top of something else. That layer is meant to hire other things, to, to hide other things rather. Um, and typically the things that it's hiding may be reused. It may be a thing that you already know about. Here's an example that I always like to use. Um, people know about HTTP, right? You all know how to like call an HTTP get and things like that, right? Um, but no one really thinks about email. No one presses F12 tools and looks at an email getting sent. This is an actual on the wire email with name value pairs, content type plane, encoding, and look, a, a little separator. Here's another separator. Here's the plain part of the email. Here's the HTML part of the email. That looks surprisingly familiar, does it not? This is posting a multi-part email, a multi-part HTML form, and this is sending email. So all this time, email, which has been around forever, is name value pairs with separators because multi-part form data is a specification and here's posting an HTML form. So would you have, would, you should be surprised, I hope you're surprised that email and HTML are similar. This is a really important thing that makes it seem like later in career people know more than they do. It's not that I know more, it's that I've seen more and that I'm, I've realized I probably already know a thing. HTML is text that goes over HTTP over a port. Email is text that uses SMTP and goes over a port. It's all just internet traffic. If you understand things at the text level, just like Lars was using the example about cars, right? It's got wheels, I can probably drive it. We've seen that in the movies where a mechanic is like, it's got wheels, I can drive it, it's got wings, I can fly it. 
Okay. Now that means we can reuse good ideas. On the left hand side, we have a spinning hard drive, physical hard drive. On the right hand side, we have an old record player, an old Victrola. And in both instances, we have a circle with encoded data that spins and a head that picks it up. And we have a circle with encoded data and a head that picks it up. And this might be terabytes and invented last year or made last year. And this might be 150 years old, but the idea is the same. A Blu-ray, a hard drive, a record player, they are the same, they are the same. Now, in computer science, we have composition. Composing things has a, it's all part of layers. Uh, layers are on top of each other. A composition are things are inside of each other. Uh, this is a real story of a thing that happened to me and, and understanding how things fit together was how I solved it. This gentleman here is my now friend, Chris Connor, who uh, is an actor. And he was in a great show on Netflix called uh, Altered Carbon. And in the film, he played an AI named Poe. He was basically an AI a construct that represented Edgar Allan Poe. And I met him on Twitter and I said, you know, I'm a big fan of your work. You're a great fella. We should hang out sometime and have tacos. So we did. So we hung out and we had tacos and he's, he's amazing. And I'm a nerd and we hung out and, uh, you know, we, he's a good dude. Then I came home after podcasting with him. And this is what I found on the SD card. This is me wondering where my files are from the interview with my new, uh, best friend, right? Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, this man is never going to be friends with me again. And we're not going to hang out at all. How am I going to call this actor and say, hey, man, can we redo that podcast that we just burnt an entire hour on? Because I'm an idiot and I lost the file. And you can see here that the hard drive had an infinite recursive empty folder. The files were gone. I don't know anything about SD cards. I don't know anything about file systems, but I do know that File Explorer is a uh, an abstraction on top of a bunch of things. Yeah, I thought I was gonna die. I was sick, literally sick. I was like, do I just ghost the guy? Do I apologize? There's no scenario where this goes well. I went into File Info and I noted that File Info said that 300 megs were used up on the disk, okay? So this is a black box, right? That's a an SD card. This is one of the SD cards that I would use. And this card had nothing on it. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm dead. But it's all about bytes, right? It's an array of bytes. It's specifically 345,776,936 bytes in, a, in an array. Let's go look at them. So I dumped that SD card, I made an image file of it because I didn't want to hurt it. Because you know, when things are corrupted, I want a copy of the corruption. I don't want to mess it up. So I made an image file. I just Googled for how to make an image file out of an SD card. And I started poking around and I knew that it was a, a fat or file allocation table card um, because you have a fat file system. And I started poking around and looking at the structures and noticing an awful lot of zeros. And the starting cluster should definitely not be zero. And I didn't know this stuff. I looked it up. You know this stuff. You know this stuff. You just don't acknowledge that you know this stuff. It's literally the difference between driving a car your entire life and never knowing there's an engine versus having a eh, passing familiarity that you can open the boot, you can open the, the trunk, you can open the front of the car and find an engine inside and go, wow, there's an engine. I'm not saying that every early in career person should become a mechanic. I am saying that a familiarity with how your car drives will make you a better, more powerful engineer, and it will allow you to be more in control. The best way to do this is to know one layer below your comfort zone. So just pick your comfort zone and go one layer below there. And like folks are saying in the chat, Google is your best friend. So I ended up fixing those bytes in the image file found that the two files, the WAV files uh, in there, and learned a lot about how applications talk to the file system, and they talk to IO control, which talks to devices, and dug in below my comfort zone and discovered how these things are composed. Exactly, Hassan is saying, go one level down, my friends. And finally, what makes 
later in career people seem magical. And what we can do to make early in career people successful is by helping them understand pattern recognition. I've seen a thing before. That seems familiar. I've heard of that. One time I spent 13 hours debugging a segmentation fault in a Raspberry Pi. And, um, oh, there's Lars. I'm almost done, Lars, like two minutes. OK, OK, we'll take it after. We'll do it. You here to now. kick me out because I'm running late? No, 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 we're not late. I feel like Just I'm keep running. going. We'll do okay. questions in a minute. OK. Well, you can, oh, he goes away and left me alone. Oh, God. All right. I spent 13 hours debugging a segmentation fault in .NET Core in a Raspberry Pi, and I would I made a file, said, hello, world. I copied it over to the Raspberry Pi, and it crashed. I was like, that sucks, and I pounded on it for a while, and it was awful. And then I even made a folder, and I put a folder called good, and I put my application in there. And I made a folder called bad, and I put the application in there. And I noticed something weird. Let's squint, shall we? Let us squint. Here's a zero D. Here's a zero D. Here's a big blank space. Here's a big blank space. Where, where are all the zero Ds? The one that doesn't run has no 13s. Zero D is. 13. Why is that? That's super annoying. Well, it turns out I was using FTP, File Transfer Protocol, to copy my files over. And you'll notice right here that this is a executable called Raspberry Pi running on Linux. It doesn't have an, an extension because Linux doesn't use extensions. And in my transfer program, there's been a bug which the, uh, the owner of the, uh, the, the manager of this open source project, FileZilla, refuses to admit as a bug called treat files without an extension as an ASCII file. ASCII, of course, being the standard, American standard of something, something character encoding, yada, yada, yada. It's the thing that describes like an A is 67 and a B is 68, those kind of things. And I realized, where have I seen 0D before? Where have I seen 0D before? Well, 0D is a 13. Like I said, it's a carriage return. And a 0A is a line feed. So my executable, my program was being treated like a text file. And it stripped out the carriage return and replaced it with nothing. Because on Unix, on Linux machines, they don't use carriage returns, they use line feeds. So it corrupted the file because it said it has no extension and it ripped it out. So then the question is, my young friends, what's a carriage? Why is it returning? We have people learning Git right now, and they're setting features like auto CRLF. They're wondering why their text files get corrupted, and they don't realize that, in fact, a typewriter has a carriage along the top here that carries the paper. And this item right over here, the carriage return, is used to go push it all the way back. So you go type, 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 do 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 Carriage return, ding. And then the knob turns, the, what's called the platen, turns and feeds the next line. Carriage return, line feed. Carriage return, line feed. Isn't it weird that a typewriter that was later hooked up as a terminal to a mainframe in the 40s somewhere, and then ASCII was invented and someone decided that 13 moves the carriage and 10 feeds the line, is now causing us consternation and frustration in the year of our Lord 2021. How do I know that? Because I dug deeper. How do you know that? Because you watched this wonderful talk at NDC and we had all kinds of fun. And now if you ever bump into an issue like that, you're going to be like, 13, 10, that's character turn line feed. Patterns, asking the right questions. How are things layered? How are they composed together? And problem solving at scale allows us to make cool stuff. And that is itself super cool. I'm going to actually skip ahead and just say to you all how happy I am that you are here and invite Lars back on to interrupt me in that way that only Lars can. And we'll do a couple of questions as we head out to our next talk. Interrupted. Consider Hello. yourself interrupted. Yeah, we do. Um, actually, I had a question as well, but we'll get to that after this one. So um, Sergey is asking, while having the right solid foundation and attitude, generals tend to struggle with practical hassles like getting a job. Any mm -hmm. advice on that? Yeah. 
that's a tough one. I have a 13 year old and a 15 year old right now. And one of the things that they're struggling with is uh, handshakes, looking people in the eye, uh, small talk. These are squishy things that we're never really learned. We never really taught. And we get all this stuff about data structures and discrete math, but not how to be noticed. I don't have good answers for that other than try to be as well balanced as you can be, be visible, be kind, show up. User groups, I would say, is how I got my start. I got my start speaking. My first talk ever was a talk on the emerging new, brand new technology. It was called XML. And I gave a talk at the Oregon Software Association on this new technology that was taken over the world called XML. And I talked to 20 people at a luncheon. And I showed up and they're like, oh, there's that guy again. Show exactly. up at user groups, be visible. People who are in the chats right now are visible. I know half of these people. Um, we've got a, a very kind gentleman in the chat here who's saying that uh, they're 42 and they struggle with handshakes and look people in the eye and small talk. It sucks that being good at computers and being good at humans is a thing that we have to balance. And then you aren't always mm. um, measured and metric on just simply your ability to ship. Um, and it seems sometimes like people with snazzy personalities get the job. Um, I would say, you know, learning to network, learning to be involved, learning to show up. What do you think the answer is, Lars? I think there's something to it uh, from what you're saying. I, I usually say that if you're uncomfortable in a, like, say, a meetup setting where there's 40 other people, the uh, people's favorite topic is usually themselves. Ooh. Or, yes. And you go, so the only thing you have to say, you walk up to someone and says, hi, what do you do? And you're off. Yeah. Right. I used to, not uh, much more to use. <laughs> I used to sell computers at a place called Incredible Universe that's now was Fry's Electronics and then recently went out of business with a computer store, big warehouse. Mm -hmm. And all the other com, uh, you know, geek squad people would go around and say, uh, you good? You're finding everything okay? Can I help you? Right. And then you always like, just browsing, just browsing, like, don't talk to me. Right. <laughs> Pretty but, much. Yep. But I, bizarre person that I am, would go up and say, are you having fun? Have you seen anything cool today? And yep. then they would go just browsing. And I'd go, that's great. But have you seen anything cool today? Mm. And th and then they like reset. And then suddenly you're talking to someone and you're, you're, you're good friends. You can practice. You can practice yeah. at the McDonald's drive through at the Starbucks. You can learn. You can practice your how to be friendly and personable on the produce guy at the totally. publisher. And the interesting thing is that people are usually in the same situation, right? They mm -hmm. don't want to start either. So if you can get, you know, past that initial kind of, oh, God, what am I doing here? Yep. Kind of feeling and go, hey, you look interesting. You don't look threatening. I'll start there. What do you mm -hmm. do? You know, as you said, what's a cool thing you learned tonight kind of thing? Exactly. And just having that little exactly. tiny icebreaker can mean so much. And again, if the person doesn't want to talk to you, they'll let you know, <laughs> you know, move on to the next one. So. There is a great YouTube channel called Charisma on Command. Oh. And what they do is they watch people who are demonstrably charming and they mm -hmm. analyze their interviews. And one of the best episodes of uh, Charisma on Command is when they take Russell Brand, who is a UK kind of like rock star type, and he's yep. known to be universally charming. And uh, they put him on a, on a very awkward, um, certain direction leaning, talk show where they're basically passive aggressive and they're mean to him and they're kind of a jerk. And it's like, mm -hmm. wow, why are we watching this incredibly painful thing? And then you see him using his body and his position and his turn and, and the way he turns and the way he presents himself. And in about 10 minutes, he turns the interview around and he's got them eating out of his hand. And then the, the commentator on this yeah. charisma on command show explains, notice what he did. He physically turned his body to, to rebuff this person who had insulted him, but he did it in a classy way. He turned, yeah. this, this was an insulting question that he answered with a question, thereby putting the honest on the person to answer. It was just full analysis of what charisma That's truly interesting. is. Yeah. Check it out. That is very interesting. It's lovely, lovely stuff. Oh. Um, well, to change subject, we have a uh, question from our mutual good friend, Adam Kogan. Uh-oh. Uh oh, yeah, that you should be scared. No, yeah. that's fine. Um, <laughs> he's just asking if you can talk about how you found your migration to TikTok. TikTok is a joy. The deal, though, with TikTok is if you just jump in, within about two days, you're going to see a bunch of inappropriate stuff and things you don't want to see. And you're going to, like, if you're, you know, uh, not interested in 
dances and skimpy clothing and bikinis and stuff, you're going to be like, why am I on TikTok? You have mm. to teach TikTok what you like. It takes about three days and you'll see some inappropriate content. That's a problem. And that turns people off of TikTok, particularly okay. older people. However, once you start liking stuff and, and the hard press, not interested on the things you don't want to hear, I have this most amazing TikTok. It's called the FYP for you, for you page. It's your personalized feed. I've got woodworking, uh, inspirational quotes from gurus. Uh, I've been, I, I found my way somehow to Native American First Nations TikTok and I'm learning about their culture, learning Japanese, right. uh, Spanish grammar, uh, geometry lessons for my kid and in, in his high school. I've got a curated stuff I'm interested in, Star Wars things, Marvel fan theories. And I'm not seeing like the stuff I don't want to see. But if I texted you a TikTok, the one you saw would be awesome, but then the next one would be something that's probably, yeah. they're just rolling the dice and you're going to end up seeing something you don't want to see. Yeah, right. I have found my way on TikTok by finding what a joy it is. Uh, yeah. And here we go. John is saying in the chat that he watches it with his son and keeps it. And they've, they've kept away from any dodgy videos. Sophie makes a great point. It's like Twitter. It's what you teach it. That makes sense. Um, I have not used TikTok, I must admit, but uh, I have heard many different varied stories D about it. DM me use. and I'll send you two or three favorites. One of the other fun things about TikToks is people will say a thing and do a thing. And then the sound can be marked as a sound. So I could go to the TikTok, see a thing where you're ranting about a barista mm. at the coffee shop, hit use sound, and then talk over you. Basically, I would lip sync to your sound. <laughs> and then that's how things go viral, right? <laughs> So there's this yeah, one right. lovely one where this woman is in the New York subway and she sees a rat and he's eating something in the subway. And she's like, you know, people ask me why I moved to the city. And it's just that I love the charm of New York. And there's just so much happening in the culture. And she's saying this while the, <laughs> so then the now rat. people use that audio to show just horrible things that are happening in New York. And, and now we have code talk and programmer talk and tech talk. It's a really very supportive, fun yeah, uh, yeah. community. That's a neat feature. Um, yeah, and yeah, I don't right. have to do any funny dances or anything. No. Yeah, and you get to listen to sea shanties and stuff. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, there will be more well, questions. Keep coming. Um, uh -oh. What's your opinion on boot camps? Do your research, and the number one way you can tell if a if a uh, a boot camp is a good idea is talk to someone who graduated. A boot so just camp to clarify, what is a boot camp? Oh, okay, so a boot camp would be um, a a fixed length intensive program that is to not necessarily simulate a degree or give you a degree, but we'll call it a nano degree or a micro degree. They're going to say, I can teach you PHP in six months. And when they mean six months, they mean 40, 50 hours. Like you quit your job, live at your parents, you know, mm. you, you can't have a job and do a, do a boot camp. It's right. a boot camp. Like we're going to put you in combat in the next six months which is different than the kind of the gentle four years of a, of an undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen people come out of boot camps incredibly successful. I think of um, uh, Saran Yatbarak from Code Newbies who, you know, did a boot camp, dropped out of medical school, became a very successful programmer, created Code Newbies, et cetera. There's a lot of people. A lot of people, though, will find that boot camps will charge them 20,000 US. They'll have to do huge loans and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's I've heard about that. imposed discipline. The structure of the boot camp provides discipline and a, a curriculum. Mm. The challenge is that you could create your own curriculum online. The, it's all available. But yeah. that requires a lot of discipline and a lot of familiarity. But I would encourage people to take out things like free code camp and, and think about the structure of that. And also CS50, the free class at Harvard and some of the open courseware things, as well as the Khan Academy oh. Computer Science, khanacademy.org yeah. slash CS, and see if you could put together your own one. Um, I would I would look at that before, and then I would uh, would talk to other folks as well. Yeah, yeah that talk makes sense. Graduates. Um, now, I had a question as well, and there's uh, from sort of way at the start of your talk, you mentioned that you try and, inst you know, you only have a finite number of keystrokes, and am I going to, use 200 keystrokes on Sophie or not, if I can write a blog post. So from that, when we talk about mentoring, at what point and how do you decide whether this particular piece of advice f is for a single person that you're talking face to face, or are you going to turn it into something that you can either present in a talk like this or in a blog post or a YouTube video, like, because there's value in both. So how, mm. how do you define, how do you decide? Um, general purpose stuff. 
like I'm always looking for things that happened privately that could be shared with more people. Um, Mads Torgerson, one of the designers in C-Sharp, shared an internal email recently about hybrid meetings, meetings that are both mixed and in-person. And I was like, wow, this is huge. It's like nine paragraphs and it's great stuff. Can I use that as the jumping point of a blog post? So I asked him, could I credit you and write a blog post about this? Um, that's something that's generic, right? Mm -hmm. If someone sends me a, well, how do I get started in podcasting or what microphone should I uh, get? I say, go and Google Hanselman, good, better, best. And I know that Google and Bing will send them to my starting a, uh, you know, getting a good webcam or Hanselman getting started podcast and they'll find those things. So I've got uh -huh. those keywords in my head. Um, but if it's very private or personal, then I keep those things separate to the, to the mentee. But I would say 80% of things like dealing with difficult people or compiler errors are a very much um, for everyone and not for yep. just one person. Okay, no, that makes sense. Um, so I'm just checking the chat here if there were people that were asking anything, because that is all the questions we have, and we are almost out of time. Lovely. So if there's nothing else, I just want to say thank you, Scott, because that was really cool. And there was, uh, as always, there was a tech element to it. I was freaking out. Artists. I was like, I don't know if this is what they want to hear. I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. Oh, was no, scary. I liked it. It wasn't scary at all. <laughs> well, well, thank you for your help. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone in the chat for keeping things Absolutely. moving. And thanks for everyone uh, who are giving us good questions. Absolutely. Yeah, that that's, uh, was very good. So thank you, Scott, from everybody. And um, oh, we have a few minutes before our next.